Fantastic. Well, just welcoming everybody. Thank you so much, guys. I hope you're having a fantastic bank holiday weekend um, and managed to watch the coronation over the weekend. Uh, we did, and actually, it was it was almost quite quite nice hunkering down in the U in the uh, UK weather. Um, watching it and making some family memories so um, yeah it's been great but I'm very very excited as always to have Paul on here Paul Merrick and we are talking about communication skills for property business growth I saw uh, Paul on another room doing a real in-depth dive into this topic and I just thought it was fascinating and there's a lot of things that Paul does that you know, you generally do it potentially in your own business or in your day to day lives, but you don't necessarily reflect on them and potentially look at them as much as you can. And the fact that, Paul, you've mentioned this whole communication as something that you've studied for a long time, in fact, for, throughout your life is you know really key and even if we haven't necessarily studied it it's like all these things isn't it it's like mindset it's like knowledge if you are aware of something then you can start being aware and working on it and moving forward and I especially think as we always talk about um, property is such a people's business in so many ways um, that when uh, when we had a chat and you were like, yeah, should we do this? I was like, absolutely. Let's let's jump on with communication. So, Paul, do you want to do a quick introduction to yourself and then uh, we'll jump in? And sorry, just before we start, guys, this is property networking It is as it says on the tin. So do feel free to uh, raise your hand to jump up on stage to have a chat. We'll, we'll have a quick sort of intro, but do feel free to join in. Um, and also, if this is useful content, please, please do like or um or become a member of this uh what's it called now a house uh it's all a bit changed now so please do please follow myself and uh paul and um yeah we really appreciate this and this will be going on to it's currently live on facebook but it will also be going on to youtube as well under emma howitt pure abodes for real paul introduce yourself so I'll give you two introductions if you like. I'll give you an introduction which is kind of um, my property or business introduction and then I'll give you an introduction which is why I might have some skills in terms of communication. So um, Paul Merrick, I have been in business for 45 years. Um, I started when I was 15 just in case you want to do the maths on it. I uh, started my first business at 15. I've been in the property industry for three decades now as a developer of both um, commercial and residential properties. I've also been a landlord of commercial and residential properties, been a business consultant for major PLCs, regeneration agencies and smaller businesses as well. Currently in the process of um, selling up our debt-free portfolio of commercial properties, residential properties and development sites as I move to being a full-time angel investor and spend more time being a business consultant. So that's my kind of business um, kind of, uh, introduction, if you like, um, bio. Uh, in terms of communication, always been interested in communication. My first ever business was working as a mobile DJ. I always wanted to be one of those people on the wilds. <laughs> I never, I never wanted to be one of the, the, the rock stars, all sex, drugs and rock and roll. I wanted to be the guy on the wireless talking about the sex, drugs and rock and roll, which tells you how exciting I am as a person. Um, and then I kind of um, went from there and um, took some elocution lessons. You'd never guess, but I did um, because I had a very, very strong Scottish accent. I'm sure many of the English listeners still think I do have a very strong Scottish accent. But in comparison with the Glaswegian accent that many people around me had, I kind of, uh, I anglicised, if you like, my accent enough that I could take it essentially anywhere in the world. Still very proud of my, my Scottish roots and re retaining the kind of element of the Scottish accent, but without the confusion of the local dialect of Glasgow. Uh, I then trained in NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, and became a master prac in NLP. Um, one of the best um, trainers in the world, uh, NLP trainers in the world, once complimented me by saying, Paul, you'll never make a great NLP trainer, but you're one of the best NLP practitioners I have ever met. And that was a compliment and a half. Um, as well as that, I went and studied psychology when I was in my uh, early 40s um, and got a qualification in psychology and also spent a bit of time studying counselling as well. So if you put all of those 
strange but strangely connected kind of um, different themes together. What you end up with is somebody who believes that communication, particularly in business, is absolutely essential. So given that communication is absolutely essential, then I took all of these you know, myriad of skills. Given that communication is absolutely essential, then I took all of these you know, myriad of skills. Given that communication is absolutely essential, then I took all of these What have I done? I don't know, but don't do it anymore. Hold on, hold on. What have I done? I don't know, but don't do it anymore. Hold on, hold on. Is that better? Better. I had to listen to myself there, and then I realised I wasn't that good at communication at all. <laughs> I was thrown. Craig said, oh, I'm going to jump on Facebook. And I thought, oh, will he do something no. on Facebook? I don't know. No, don't jump on Facebook. <laughs> jump, on, jump on Clubhouse. We know how this works. Yes, yeah, I was going to say, this is as far as my, my tech works. Sorry, okay, sorry okay. about that, Paul. Don't, don't get clever on, on Facebook. Just... <laughs> Just stay on Clubhouse. Um, so all of those kind of myriad of skills help to build a communicator. So um, I think what we'll do is, as you say, you kind of picked up on this from another room. So if you want to kind of reflect back to that other room um, and say, well, I heard this, Paul, and it sounded really useful, then I'll try and elaborate on that if that would be helpful. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, as, as I sort of touched on earlier, for me, you know, it's always banded around, you know, property, it's a people's business, it's a people's, you know, game, so to speak. And it's totally is, it is about making relationships. And what's really key for me as well is making relationships and re very much on a win-win perspective. So whether that's, you know, with vendors, whether that's with, you know, I run service accommodation, whether that's with your team, whether that's with your management agent, whether that's with your estate agent, um, and whether that's with your investors or JV partners, it, it really is a, a very powerful scenario to have great kind of communication skills. So I know um, initially um, you and I'd love you to to pop on this because it was very interesting. Um, you, you know, you, you, you talked about how. You know, you know, the communications you spoke about. Pausing, which I'm terrible at, that makes me feel incredibly uncomfortable um so um you mentioned you know emphasizing words but you did a really great um sort of practical role on on talking about emphasis in words i wondered if we might sort of do that again perhaps yeah um so uh, that was when we took kind of a sentence right um and then we kind of emphasized the different word every time which kind of um then changed the sentence entirely so what we'll do is we'll, we'll role play with that if you, if you don't mind. So I'll give you a sentence and what I want you to do is I want you to write the sentence down. And then what I want you to do is I want you to take each individual word and emphasize on that word and then see the difference in the way the sentence sounds to the people both listening and watching. Right. So the sentence is, did you take the money from the cupboard? Did you take the money from the cupboard? Okay, I'm just popping it into the chat box. Okay, so you want me to emphasize each word on its own in the sentence? Yes, so take the first word. Okay. And then emphasize it. Did you, oh, did you take the money from the cupboard? Okay, now move to the next one. Did you take the money from the cupboard? Try that again. More emphasis. Did on you. Did you so, so lower so lower the dead did you okay. take the money from the cupboard? Did you take the money from the cupboard? A little more emphasis on you. <laughs> did you take the money from the cupboard? Did you take the money from the cupboard? Okay, now move to the next one. Did you take the money from the cupboard? Very good. Do that again so that people can hear that. Did you take the money from the cupboard? Very good. Moving on. Next one. Um, did you take the money from the cupboard? Did you take the you money take, from the cupboard? Did you take the 
money from the cupboard? Did you take the money from the cupboard? Try it. Did you take the money from the cupboard? Okay, now the next one. Did you take the money from the cupboard? Very good. Now, now listen to that yourself, right? And people listening to the room listen to that. Can you hear the entirely different meanings of those sentences? So you've said the same thing several times, but because you take your emphasis and put it in a different place, you entirely change the sentence. Yeah, now, we're going to do another exercise. We're going to take that same sentence, we're going to emphasise a word, and then we're going to pause. So start again, take the first word, emphasise the word, and then pause. And then say the rest of the sentence. And then say the rest of the sentence. Did you take the money from the cupboard? Okay, next one. Did you take the money from the cupboard? More, more, more pause after you. Did more you, emphasis and more pause. Did you take the money from the cupboard? No, no, pause. Did you take the money from the cupboard? Did you take the money from the cupboard? <laughs> One more time. Did you take the money from the cupboard? I feel so awkward with pauses. <laughs> <laughs> so pauses are very strong. So if I was saying to you, Emma, did you take the money from the cupboard? There's no real emphasis there. But if I said to you, did you take the money from the cupboard? So an entirely different sentence. <laughs> yeah, it so is, isn't it? And do you, is this something that comes to you naturally? Because I just sit there thinking, you know, when you get into this kind of level of detail, it's a lot going swimming around your head. Is this just something that you've done? Obviously, you trained as LLP, you've done it for so long that do you think, oh, I, you know, I'm going to spend time emphasizing this or it just, just comes naturally to you? I've been working on this for a very long time. So I came from a very poor background in the East End of Glasgow where well, vocabulary um, was was very short in our family. So I used to listen to Radio 4 when I was about 12. And what I would do is I would collect a word from Radio 4 every day, a word that I didn't understand, or, you know, and then look that word up and work out what that word meant. And then what I would do is kind of like try and squeeze it into sentences. So in so many ways, I have been working on communication for my whole life. Um, you know, it's interesting the, the things I've done in life, and many people see me as a property developer, many people see me as a businessman. I really see myself as a salesperson still communicator. Because I think if you, if you take the essence of all the money that we have ever made, it's all about that ability to negotiate with another human being. I think... You know, um... That's really interesting what you say about the vocabulary, um, because I, I follow um, Bob Proctor and, and um, all of his kind of trainings and stuff like that. And one of the things that he, he trains on is to grow your vocabulary. And he, he's done some research or there has been some research that generally the, the more successful, wealthy people have a broader vocabulary um supposedly so that's quite interesting that you've you've um um yeah you've spoken about that communication is really about two things right um a, a really good communicator because i do a lot of public speaking i've been a professionally paid public speaker for about 12 years and you know one of the things that people try to do in communication you'll find it quite a lot with poor communicators is they try to make a simple thing sound really complicated to make themselves sound clever and I'm sure you've come across that, you know, you, you employ people and they try to make the simplest things sound very complicated to make them sound like they're worth their money, essentially, right? And the truth of the matter about a good communicator is a good communicator takes a very complicated thing and makes it very simple. But do you think because that's also a skill in itself, in the fact that you maybe look at things in a different way? So, for instance, uh, one, well, my boys are sort of a bit dyslexic. 
And one of my boys, I mean, he just looks at everything totally differently from me. Like I'll, I'll sort of mention, oh, you know, we're, we're attempting to do this. And he'll literally just go, well, why don't you do it like, you know, typical kind of 17 year old boy. Well, why don't you do it like this? And I'm a bit like, oh, because it just would never come into my mind to even think in that way. But how very clever, you know, absolutely. So it's it's kind of more than just the way of communicating, isn't it? It's, it's potentially the way you break it down in your head and then you're able to, to share that, so to speak. So again, I, 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 there's a chap who I work with who's an engineer and he basically takes the complex and makes it simple. But he does it more like writing it down and you kind of put it onto a piece of paper and suddenly what was really complex in your head is suddenly really simple on a piece of paper. So it's, it's more than just explaining it, isn't it? It's, it's actually understanding and then being able to verbalise it. It's, it's really about speaking the other person's language. Right. You know, one of the one of the ways to communicate, I mean, we'll touch on kind of building rapport in a moment or two, but one of the ways to communicate with another person, if you want to really build rapport with another person, is you speak in their language. So, for example, one of the guys that I'm working with as a business consultant is a GP. Um, so what I do with that person is I speak in language that he would understand and I do analogies related to medicine. And that makes it very simple for him to understand. Another chap that I'm working with um, is, you know, he spends a lot of time in the gym and he spends a lot of time kind of, and he spent his whole life playing football and doing sport and doing martial arts. So for him, I will speak in terms of sporting analogies. And, and what you must remember is that language is very, very interesting. You know, it's, I, I remember um, working with a, a an NLP coach and helping him with one of his courses. And I brought something new to him that he'd never used before, and which I learned from one of the co-creators of NLP, because I was lucky enough, I was lucky to be trained by one of the co-creators of NLP, one of the two people who actually invented it. And um, and I, I was taught that what you do is, if you put six people in a room and you take a word like love or heat or danger, and you ask six people to write down what that means to them, it's very unlikely you will get the same answer twice. So every word that we use, me and you, we think we mean the same thing, but we don't. So really, to be a good communicator is not about speaking at people. It's about listening to people. So the skill of a great communicator is not how well you can speak. It's really how well you can listen. So I will pick up on the nuances of your language and say, right, okay, when, you know, Emma uses the word, I love this, this has this connotation to Emma, but it has an entirely different connotation to me. Yeah, yeah, really, and so interesting. And I, I think this whole communication thing, I know, I remember when I very first started in a, the corporate world and I arrived at L'Oreal and I was all very excited, you know, and then, you know, we started emailing, obviously it's a bit of a while ago now, <laughs> it's kind of, um, but I remember getting into trouble over an email that I sent because I just slammed out an email. I didn't reread it. And what had come out of my head to me seemed, you know, seemed great. And I'm a, you know, I'm a very polite person. I, I kind of, you know, take a bit of pride in, you know, being kind and all of that. Anyway, it was read in a way that it felt almost aggressive the email because obviously I just banged it out and that was a you know it was a frightening learning for me but it was a great learning for me to understand that people read things totally differently haven't we we've all sent a text message we've all sent that we've all said things to other people and they can be read differently um, and I learned a new thing recently as well about mirroring so you know you and I could mirror your you've got your hand on your chin I, I could I could mirror that but even in the, the written word, so in um, WhatsApp messages, so obviously we communicate a lot via WhatsApp and um, I was in a sales scenario and, um, and they were mirroring. So if somebody did one, one, um, one or two word answers, then you mirror that one or two word answer. And if it's, you know, if they write war and peace, then you write a bit more war and peace. And, you know, it's just so many, as you say, nuances like that, that, I had just hadn't even thought of. So yeah, I think it's, you know, really tremendous to have these kind of things. And would you start, you know, to somebody 
who, who say really early on in this, would you say kind of choose something and just work on that until that is part of your kind of core? Or would you advise to, you know, to go and do LLP? Or what, what would you advise for people to start going? I know that's a bit of an end, end of the session question, but it's it's an interesting one. Well, I think, you know, if you think property is a big subject, then look at communication and you'll see what a really big subject is. Now, for somebody, um, no, so nobody is a starting communicator. You know, nobody's coming into this industry and they've never communicated before, right? But have they communicated well and have they communicated in a relevant way to what they're doing now? So, so one of the things that quite often happens um, in communication that breaks down communication is, and you just said it, I'm a very polite person, right? So in a negotiation, for example, you get two people being very polite to each other and saying nothing. <laughs> yeah, I love that. <laughs> and they both come away and go, I have no idea around each that, other. <laughs> I have no idea where that other person is. I have no idea what they want from this, right? And then you come away and you say, well, I have no idea what they want either, but they were a lovely person, right? Now, I'm not often described them as a lovely person, right? I think you're lovely, Paul. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Right? The, the fibre's in the post, yeah, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, but actually, in something like a negotiation, yes, you've got to build rapport, but you've also got to be fairly direct. Do you know, this yeah. is what I need from you, and what do you need from me? Right. And and it's interesting, you know, people go and see houses, for example. Let's take a let's take a real scenario, right? And let's imagine that there's a house on the market, right? And let's imagine that you're coming to see that house. Right. And and a bit of role play. We'll do a bit of role play. How about that? Perfect. Right. Okay. So I'm selling a house and you want to buy this house for whatever reason. Right. So let's go through a kind of a role play of how you might go about that. So I'm opening the door, you're booked a viewing with the agent, the vendor showing you around, and let's let's do a kind of five minute role play on that. So hi. hi, are you are you Emma? Yes, hi, is it Paul? I'm Paul, yes. Oh, fantastic to meet you. Shake hands. Oh, brilliant. Oh, well, thank you so much for meeting me here today. I really appreciate your time. No problem at all. I've got a few viewings um, this afternoon, so I, I'm staying in for them. Fantastic. And and so what, uh, how long have you had the property? First mistake. <laughs> Should I have talked about your clean shaven skin or your, never, your corduroy never. trousers? You made, the, you made the, the first mistake. I would say that 80% of the audience who are listening to this now who are, or who listen back to it will make. You talked about the property. Yeah. Yeah, you're absolutely right. What's people's favourite subject, Emma? Themselves, Paul. <laughs> Indeed, Emma. Right. <laughs> um, so let's imagine that we've walked into somebody's house and we've did the hellos, right? And we've walked in and we look around and we see that they have pictures of their children or they have pictures of animals, right? One of the first things I would say was, so let's say, let's say it was animals, for example, and it was horses in your case. And there was pictures of horses and kind of horse memorabilia all about the house, right? I would say, so do you like horses then, Emma? Oh, absolutely. Yes, we've got probably too many. <laughs> How many horses do you have at the moment? Uh, we currently have three. That's a lot of horses. I had a friend once who said he had children and horses, and horses are more expensive than children. <laughs> and that's interesting. Sean has just put in a, a comment with this, and it's something that I, I would agree with. He said, um, great conversation. My communication is poor. Should have worked on it years ago. Words evoke images. We all call upon different images. Um, and I struggle with small talk, um, which is an interesting one, which is what we're doing here. So that's what we're doing, right? So, um, have, have, do you ride? Is it your children that ride? Who does? Who does the majority of the riding? Yes, I have been riding a little bit more recently because uh, one of my sons is is away at, at Sixth Form College. Uh, but yes, inherently, I have them for my kids. I grew up with horses, and it was such a incredible opportunity that I want my kids to have that too. 
did you have you know a horse when you were very young oh yes I I pretty much can't really remember life well there was never life without horses um in our family that's all we talk about even now um, when my parents haven't obviously got horses anymore when we come around the dining room table generally it will be about horses so yeah and and did you have a favorite horse oh I mean I have some I have some that I look back fondly with, certainly my early ones, but I do have one that I was, you know, very successful on. Um, so I suppose, yeah, that would be the one that I, I remember mostly, you know, I, I achieved some very great things with him, really. So you did competition riding then? Yes, yes. What was your best competition? Um, so I represented the South East. Uh, I got the best dressage. Um, yeah, I suppose doing Windsor horse trials. Um, yeah, var varying things. Uh, I suppose, yeah, um, pony club championships. That's like a really big thing when you're a kid. Um, so, yeah, yeah, it was good. It was, a, it, and in fact, after that, it was a choice for me whether to go professional or not. Um, and I chose not to. I see when you talked about the kind of the, the pony trials there, that was a kind of your face lit up. So I take it you you remember that kind of both for yourself and your children with like really good memories. Yeah, absolutely. And these events, they're so big, like with the kids now, like we go away for weekends away and it just makes such incredible memories. And that's you can't buy those, can you? So that's that's to me just amazing. You know, my 17, I mean, one of mine rode until he was 16, my other son's. 17 and to have boys twin boys to ride for that long is is quite amazing um so it's, it's also hard work but good fun yeah and not as um there are boys that kind of that, that ride but not as many as there are girls so kind of like keeping boys interested must be <laughs> tougher than keeping girls interested i think because it's it's seen as a a more female sport but um lots of guys kind of do ride and, and ride really well so you must be proud of the boys then yeah i mean there's a lot more males at the at the top top level but at the at the grassroots level yeah it's majority ladies yeah so we did just over five minutes there right yeah. did any of that feel uncomfortable at all no no it was good yeah absolutely i think it's an interesting one isn't it because yeah, you're right, Sean. Paul has made me feel good and relaxed. But I'm um, I'm a very practical person. And in fact, I was talking to a, a potential investor the other day and I literally had to stop myself doing what I did with you earlier and jumping straight in and go and have the small chat. And I have to be really careful not to make it just part of the routine. You know, like you say, you've got to listen, you've got to be genuinely interested. And I am, but you know, quite often it's um, you know, it's it's, it's more not, of a practical it, it, thing. I can see my business partner in the, you know, in the chat. We we'll often sit down and we'll we'll have been chatting business, and then it's you know, you feel like you should ask about their family. I mean, and we do genuinely care, but we just tend to just jump straight into it. But it is also really important to have that background as well. So let's talk about why then. So let's take that hypothetical situation where you're building rapport with um, a potential vendor. Mm. Now, there might be in a, in, in, in a strong market, there might be half a dozen offers go in for that property. And really what you want from that vendor is you want that vendor to remember you. Yeah. And you want that vendor to want to sell you their house, right? Because it might come down to two offers that are very, very similar. And then they choose the person. Now, it's interesting. I've been doing this job for 30 years. If I came to you to see your house, do you know how many questions I would ask you about your property? It sounds like maybe not so many. None. Okay, two reasons for that. One, you're selling the property. Are you likely to tell me the whole truth and nothing but the truth to help you God? <laughs> <laughs> there may be some poetic license in there indeed right so if i've got research to do on the property that's my job it's not your job as the vendor to do my research for me that's my own job so therefore i should have done all of that research long before i waste your time and come and see a property 
And that is one of the issues I have with a lot of people who are new into property. They want the vendor or the agent to tell them everything that they should actually have worked out for themselves. You know, the vendor and the agent are selling the property. They're not a good, they're, they're not an unbiased source of information, either of them. They're a very biased source of information. So what I want to do when I come to see you is I want to see why you love the property. And I want to tell you that I'm going to love it in the same way. And what if they, you know, if they've, they've had a nightmare with the property, is that the, you're going to help bring it back to life? So if I'm just thinking about one at the moment that I've got, you know, that it's, you know, the poor landlord has had a nightmare tenant and there's cat poo in the bathroom and, you know, it's, it's really been, and he's, he's just wants it gone. Okay, so role play that person then. Me, I'll be so there. I'm, I'm coming to see you. You've got a nightmare property, right? Yeah. Um, and role play that person. Yeah, so, Paul, come in, have a look. I mean, it's it's horrific. I'm I'm really sorry. Uh, you know, we we've literally only just got the tenant out, and as you can see, well, you you'll need a mask to cover your nose because it's just really smells. I know I know exactly how you feel. We once bought a property um, from an administrator. Mm -hmm. And um, the chap that had been in it was an alcoholic, right? And if I say to you without being too graphic that he never made his way to the bathroom, Oof. Um, bit there, like was the no cat here. there was no there was no kitchen in it whatsoever, right? Um, and uh, how he managed to live in there, I have no idea. And we had to put the guys in with the full, you know, uh, PPE gear, right, to clean it out because literally, as I say, I don't want to be too graphic, but he literally never used the bathroom, just wherever he was, right? Um, and it was terrible. But, you know, we turned it around and we turned it into a nice property because that's what we do, right? Um, so um, tell me about tell me about your journey. How, how did you end up in, in this? How did you end up kind of being involved as a landlord in this? Are you, are you a, a landlord who's been a landlord for a long time and this has been a bad experience or is this new? Yeah, absolutely. So I've, I've had this property for you know, really a number of years. It's been really great um, journey. It's, it, you know, it's made me some good returns. I've had some great tenants. Um, but since, you know, Section 24 and this particular tenant has just made, you know, this this property um, just not something that I want to carry on with. It uh, can get you like that sometimes. So, um uh, we'll have a look, look, look round and kind of um, um, kind of come to our own assessment with it. Um, be interesting to learn a little bit more about yourself, though. So, is 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 this a full time job or is this part time job? What is it for you? Yeah, I mean, I'm obviously a little bit older now, and um, yeah, we've got we've got a number of properties, and yeah, we're just looking to sell up. My wife's found a nice property in uh, you know Tobago. <laughs> we're going to move there. All right, so you're going to move abroad? Yeah. Are you excited about that? Cannot wait, yes. We love the sun and, um, yeah, all our kids and uh, grandkids are quite grown up now as well. So we just want to have that time to to go and spend time over there and we'll also come back and vi visit the family regularly and they'll come and visit us. Sounds great, retirement in the sun. Has it kind of always been on the cards or just as you kind of get older, you think, oh, the sun's looking good? Yes, I think, yeah, my wife's a big fan and um, I've come around to it now. So, yeah, that's that's the way we're going. Oh, <laughs> do you think you'll be bored or do you think you'll get better used to being a retired man quite easily? Uh, I'll always have something that will keep me entertained. So, um, no, I think I'll, uh, yeah, I'm sure I'll jump on the golf course or get involved in something locally. Uh, yeah, no, I, I won't get bored. Yeah, I, I tried golf a couple of times. What is it that they say about people? It's a, it's a waste of a good walk for people like me. I'm terrible at golf. <laughs> and all my friends have got handicaps of like five and six, so I don't kind of go out with them because I just slow the whole game down. So have you been a golfer before or is this a new kind of thing you're going to try? Uh, I did it when uh, much younger around sort of when I was in the corporate world. It was kind of part of the, the gentleman's network, I suppose. Um, but yeah, I do enjoy it. It's great to be outside. Um, I have done a lot of golf around the world and um, yeah, I'm looking forward to, yeah, to getting a bit better. I think having, uh, yeah, having that time, which I think you don't have normally to improve my swing and yeah, I get good with it. 
I think the thing about retirement is, because um, I've got a couple of friends who are retired, is that when you go out, they tell me this, that when you go out and play golf when you're retired, you're actually playing golf. Whereas, you know, when you're doing it in a corporate environment or if you're working, you're still kind of 20% of your mind's on the golf and 80 percent's on work. So it's probably going to be great to go out and kind of play golf and just be playing golf. Absolutely. Absolutely. I've got a question to ask here as well. So Robin has said, would different personality types require a different approach to how you communicate with them? Because I'm getting to the stage where I think if I was the, uh, the vendor, I'd be getting a bit like knocked now. I'd be kind of walking off. You and... wouldn't actually, you wouldn't actually, you're saying that, um, but you weren't knocked when we were talking about horses. You were knocked when you were playing somebody else. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Right. So you can't play somebody else. And that's one of the issues with role play. When you yeah. do role play, you should only ever play yourself. Yeah. Right. Because your emotional connection, we could have talked about horses for 20 minutes. Yeah. But you were trying to be somebody else there. So yeah. you were getting bored. Yeah. Right. And, and the, 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 the notice about that is when you're listening to another person and if they're going off and they're looking bored, then you haven't actually caught the thing they're interested in. Okay. And it's for you to move the subject. So you're not really a middle-aged man going to play golf. <laughs> you so, noticed, I'm glad. <laughs> yeah, well, you can never tell these days, let's be honest. <laughs> um, but... You know, it's kind of like you were you were playing a you were playing a character and you got bored of playing the character. But when we we're talking about the horses, five minutes passed in like five seconds, didn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. But 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 the learning from that, and I did that for a reason because I knew you were going to get bored, right? Because you were playing somebody else and making it up in your head. Is I could see the boredom and anybody watching and listening could hear the boredom. Yeah. But you might you might do that with another person. So I might have picked on a different subject other than horses for you. Right. And you might have thought, I'm not really that. I'm a little bit interested in that, Paul, but not a five minute conversation worth. Yeah. And it's my job as a company communicator to listen with two ears and speak with one mouth. In other words, to hear, actually, I've lost, I've been in this conversation for a minute and I've lost Emma. Let me find her again. I was never going to find you in that role play because you were playing somebody else. Yeah. So do you think in this kind of initial, um sort of conversations I mean this is obviously you know coined as as building rapport is that the real key for you is speaking about them is is that what helps you build rapport because I know when you you spoke about it in in your other room you you spoke about trust uh, honesty sincerity um I also added in myself that whenever I'm sort of going into a conversation, I'm always thinking about a kind of a win-win outcome. I want everyone to 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 feel like you know they've you know not been bowled over, sort of thing. So is in this instant, or is there lots of different ways of building rapport? But this one seems very much if you you're talking about them and understanding them rather than the the property. Well, as I said about the property. Anything you need to understand about the property is your job yeah. to do visa, right? I, I, no disrespect intended, and I've, I've known you on Clubhouse for about a year now, Emma, and if I was coming to buy a property off of you, I would take everything you said about your property that you were selling me, telling me and selling me as a lie. <laughs> okay. Because, you know, with all due respect, if you go to buy a car tomorrow morning, do you actually listen to the sales guy or do you do your own research? Yeah, absolutely. When somebody comes to sell you double glazing, do you actually listen to what they say or do you look at the paperwork? Yeah. And, and we've got this confusion in the industry of the vendor and their agent are going to tell you the truth, right? Do you know when a vend do you know when an agent's lying? When the when they move their lips, right? <laughs> so. <laughs> and, oh, that's so funny. And, 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 and the same can be true about a vendor so what I really want to understand about a vendor is what makes you tick communication is about what makes you tick right and I'm going to give you an analogy when we were both younger and single I can barely remember that far back but I'll do my best right yeah. but when we were both younger and single yeah. right imagine a guy coming up to you in a bar and going want a date 
or being even more explicit than that, Emma, right? What would you say to him? Um, thanks, but no thanks. Exactly, right? So what we're really doing with people when we meet them is we're flirting with them, we're dating them, right? Do you want to sell your house to me? Yes. Well, I, now, if I you think don't so. want to sell your house to me and you want to sell it to Joe that was in half an hour before me, to a certain extent, my offer's going to have an impact, but if they're very close to each other, you're going to sell it to Joe. Yeah. So our job really isn't about asking a vendor about his property or her property. It's about building rapport. Do we have something in common? So if you look at what I did when you were role-playing very badly, a middle-aged man, right? because we all role-play somebody else very badly. Yeah, We yeah. role-play ourselves very, very well, but we role-play other people very badly. Yeah. So when you were badly role-playing a middle-aged man, yeah. right, um, about to retire, when you're at a point in your career where you want to make it all happen, yeah. it was so outside of your reality, you couldn't deal with it. Yeah. But the first thing I talked about to that man that hypothetical man was, yeah, I've had a bad experience with a tenant or with a property too. Yeah. We've got something in common. And it's that commonality yeah. that builds relationships. It's very difficult to build a relationship with another human being that you have nothing in common with. And where do you go if there isn't, you know, you can't find that common ground. So let's say we start a conversation and you walk in and there's obviously something going on and they're very closed. I've never found another human being that's very close. Um, I've found people who are very good at closing human beings. Okay. You know, asking them a whole bunch of questions about their property, for example, and they they feel quite tense about selling the property. They don't, they don't feel comfortable lying, but they don't want to tell you 100% of the truth. There's a great way to close another person down. Ask them questions they don't want to answer. Yeah. So if you go in and, and there's something about that property that person doesn't want to share with you and you're interrogating them, Emma. Yeah. And they don't want to out blatantly lie to you, then that person's going to close down. Yeah, very because interesting. You're asking them questions they don't want to answer. Yeah. Yeah. And Jodie's put in here, um, so you have to read the body language too, um, lots to focus on. I mean, certainly I, I remember I had a meeting very recently with a developer and he just physically was very closed. He had his arms folded. He had a very stern face and it took him, you know, a good few minutes to kind of open up and and and, and be more kind of welcoming. I'm trying to think what exactly I, I said, but um, yeah, I'm kind of, you know, like you do, I'm questioning kind of what what I said at the time to open that up. So you kind of, it sounds like you kind of see that as a real not challenge, but like, you know, I, I've got an armory of questions that I can ask to enable me to, for this person to, to open up. I find the best way to open people up is just talk about life. Not talk about business, not talk about deals, not talk about investments, not talk about properties, just talk about life. But sometimes I will be very direct with someone. And, and actually the question I would ask them was not what you said to open him up, but what was it in the initial meeting that you said that closed him down? Because you're presuming he started closed. Yeah. And you could probably see that person with 10 other people and they looked very comfortable and open. So yeah. it wasn't really much so much what you did to open them up. The question really is, what did you do to close them down? So I have literally had conversations where someone has pulled back and I have said during that conversation, feel like I've lost you somewhere, Emma, along the way. What do you mean, Paul? I, I feel like you're kind of pulling back. Is there something I've said that annoyed you or frustrated you? Just, just tell me. There's a lot of... And do they Dancing. respond? More often than not. More often than not, people want to tell you what they think, Emma. Yeah. And people want to tell you what they feel. But sometimes you have to give them the opportunity to do that. Yeah. You have to give them permission to let. 
to uh, allow them to say it, so to speak. Yeah. Listen, in some way, shape or form, Emma, I've obviously insulted you or annoyed you. I'm really sorry. I didn't mean to do it. Believe me, if I'd have meant to insult you, we would, you would know. <laughs> <laughs> so I've accidentally insulted you. Tell me what I said or what I've done. I like it. I like it. And um, sorry, Jody has also put, how can you deal with people who already decided on something before you've even started speaking? Um, that's called the art of persuasion, Jody. Um, and when does persuasion become manipulation? Very good question, but it's the art of persuasion, right? So the first question that you ask yourself in that situation is, is somebody worth persuading? Or are they not? Right, because persuading is is quite a difficult exercise in communication. So the first question that you should ask yourself, Jody, is is that person worth persuading? Yeah. So with that if being just to put persuading. put that in context, so I'm always talking. You know, when you when you people are looking for, for instance, a rent to rent deal, kind of I have a bit of a view that if the landlord doesn't have any sort of problems and he's always had great tenants. They've always worked really well for him. It more than likely is going to be a no, because it's such a huge thing to, as you say, persuade them that something that they're not used to is going to be a benefit of them. Whereas if we go back to the the chat we were talking about earlier, where you know he he'd had lots of great tenants, however, the last tenant had been so extreme and so horrific that he then had a problem. That if you can solve as a you know if, if, as a rental person, um, then that I suppose gives you something to work on. So I suppose it's always knowing, like like you went mentioned, whether there is a problem to solve, so to speak. There's an old adage in business: is you can't help people who are rich, fat, fat and happy. <laughs> <laughs> so don't try and help the rich, fat and happy. They're already rich, fat and happy. Right? <laughs> Um, and if they are, you've got very little you can bring to their life, right? Um, so you're really looking for people who have got a problem to solve. I mean, that's the basis of business, isn't it? We, you know, we tend to buy things that make our life easier, yeah. right? Um, and if you're selling something, whether it's a concept or whether it's a physical item that makes somebody's life easier, all you have to do is explain that to them. But they have to have that the the problem in the first place. Um, but a lot of that is about so 101, if you like, of using this example of going to buy a property, right? I would say that a good 90% of people start that from the wrong place. They see something advertised, it sparks a small interest in them, and then they go to see it. And then they're looking for the vendor or the agent to tell them everything they need to know. And they're looking, they're really looking for the vendor and the agent to sell them something. Because if you think about the vast majority of people's life who haven't had a life in business, they've been sold to their whole life. Yeah. When they go to the shop, they get sold to. Subliminally, but they get sold to. When they go buy a car, they get sold to. When they you know, go to buy furniture, they get sold to. When they go to buy a holiday, they get sold to. So they take this mindset of this vendor should be and this agent should be selling me this property. And actually, if you want to buy properties at the right price, the right properties that suit you, it's not their job to sell. It's your job to buy. In fact, somebody once asked me at a party once what I did in property. And I didn't want to get into a long debate about it in discussion. And I said, I buy things that aren't for sale for amounts of money people don't want to take. <laughs> Do you want to repeat that? Yeah, I buy things that are not for sale for amounts of money people don't want to take. So I don't tend to buy properties and never have in my 30 years career that's on right move. In fact, I think right move's the wrong move. But because what I do is I build rapport with people and I convince people that I'm the right person to sell to. And, and equally, Emma, if I come to buy your home or one of your commercial properties or whatever, and we struck up a conversation and something in that conversation told me that I wasn't the right person, I would say, thank you, Emma, I think there's a better buyer than me. Now, there's an original concept for people, isn't it? 
I think there's a better buyer than me of this property. I only want to do a deal with people for whom I'm the right person to do a deal with. Yeah, absolutely. And I suppose that goes back to that kind of win-win scenario where inherently everyone has got to benefit in that deal communication. If, you know, if one person's going to be walking away feeling like they've been done over, it's never going to be a great deal and it's not going to be a success. Well, I think, you know, what you've got to remember about property is where it differs from a lot of other transactions, right? is that it takes a long time to do a property deal. So you might convince somebody for five minutes, but will you convince them for five months? Yeah. Whereas if I'm selling you a widget, look, great widget. Do you want to buy my widget? Yes, I do, Paul. There you go. And then you can have buyer's regret afterwards. You know, and at best in this country, you've got 30 days cover, right? Property deals. How long did the last property deal take between the first time you met the person and you actually owned the property? Four or five months? Yeah, at least quite often. Yeah. And you need to carry that person with you for that four or five months. So, I mean, we're rapidly running out of time, but the way I deal with people is entirely different and alien to the way most people deal with people. So if I was coming to you and we built up rapport and I listened to you and I didn't ask you about your property because that's my job, I didn't ask you to sell me your property because that's not your job. You're not a salesperson. I just asked you about you and we built rapport. I would say to you, look, here's where we are, Emma. I'm the right guy to buy your property. I think you know that. This is the right property to sell to me. If it wasn't, I wouldn't be buying it. It's an amount of money. It's a deal that we can both live with. Right? You know, what's a great negotiation, Emma? A great negotiation is when both people go away unhappy. <laughs> I've not heard that one. Because <laughs> if you think about it, Emma, if yeah. you were entirely happy, it wouldn't be a negotiation. You would have got 100% of what you want. Yes? Yeah. And if I got 100% of what I want, you wouldn't be happy, would you? No, uh, you're right. Right. So we both get a little bit of what we want. So to a certain extent, we go away happy and unhappy. Right. A great negotiation, both people go away unhappy. <laughs> um, but we're, we're happy in the, our unhappiness with each other. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. The lawyers are now going to get involved and they're going to make this thing very complicated and drag it out. And I am going to offer you, and I would like the same from you, every time I receive an email from my solicitor, I'm going to copy you into it. I want a completely open and above board transaction between us. I don't want my solicitor saying something to me that you don't know about. I don't want your solicitor saying something to you that I don't know about. I'm going to give you a whole bunch of my money. And partly I'm doing that because I like your property, Emma. And partly I'm doing that because I like you. And I hope you're taking a whole bunch of my money because you want to sell your property. And I'm hoping you're taking that whole bunch of money from me because you want to deal with me. So see these other people that we need. They are not the deal. Me and you are, Emma. We have a deal. Wow. Do you do that then? Every time. God, I would never have thought of doing that. That's very powerful, isn't it? I, I tell you what you find as well. You find lying solicitors because you'll get an email that says, we haven't received this document oh. from the other side. Oh, yeah. Right? And I've got an email that I send you that said, the solicitor sent that document on Monday and your solicitor's lying to you. And I'll tell you what happens when I do that, Emma, right? The person's relationship with the solicitor breaks down yeah. because solicitors lie. Yeah. Yeah, that's happened to us recently. Our solicitor lied to us and yeah. we had to get in contact with the other solicitor. And it was, yeah, it was confirmed that he'd lied, not by a week, but by, you know, like six weeks. So, so what happens in a situation like that is you lose faith in your solicitor. Yeah. But because I'm being transparent with you, who do you have faith in? Yeah, yeah. See, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end on this, right? In property, the system, the system, solicitors, agents, the whole system is built in a way that they make you and me as the vendor and the buyer feel like we're in competition. Yeah. Or confrontation. 
not negotiation. Yeah, that's very powerful. So I don't want to be, a, if I come to buy your house, Emma, and you want to be in confrontation with me, I do confrontation in court. I've got some of the best lawyers in the United Kingdom. Start Try saying something wrong about me. You'll discover very quickly what confrontation looks like. Yeah. But I didn't come to your house to do confrontation. The solicitors want it to be confrontation. They get paid more. The agents want it to be confrontation. They get paid more. I want to negotiate with you. And negotiation is where we both get our best outcome. Yeah. Amazing. See, one of the skills that I had and one of the skills that I have is negotiation skills in the same way as a professional negotiator that you would send in to get hostages, hostage negotiation. Yeah. Now, think about this. Right. As a hostage negotiator, I, you have got you're you're the terrorist, right? And you've got a hundred hostages. Do I want to negotiate that we get fifty hostages alive and fifty hostages dead? No. Do I want to negotiate that we get a hundred hostages alive but we kill you? Maybe. I don't. Because that's not the best outcome for a hostage negotiator. A hostage negotiator really wants everybody to come out alive. Yeah. Now, yeah, you might serve some time, but that's better than being dead. Yeah. And as a hostage negotiator, I would say to you, look, we've got choices here. But the ideal choice is nobody dies here. Absolutely. Yeah. In a, a, a negotiation, a property negotiation, you know the best outcome? We both get what we need. And none of us get exactly what we want. Yeah. And Jody has just asked a question here. I know we're top of time now, but um, how can you spot when someone is misusing NLP? Are there any telltale signs? I'm just really annoyed because I did that bang on time there. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did a really clever ending, bang on time, in a professional speaking style. -y. <laughs> you were like, oh, and yeah. Then, and then you just blew it. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm here to mess things up, Paul. You know that. <laughs> you, you, but you do it so well, Emma. That's not <laughs> um, How do you know if somebody's using NLP in a bad way? That's a very big question, um, Judy. What's a bad way? What's a bad way? You know, this is the negotiation, manipulation. Yeah, that's what we hear, um, don't we? That you know, you know, this this person way? is forcing force them to buy through NLP manipulation. Yeah, uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, I only know one way to force people to do something. It's usually a gun to their head. Um, I've never been forced to do something by a few words in my life. And if you're a weak enough character that a few words um, will will manipulate you, Jody, then I would suggest you stop blaming the other person and you work on your character. Yeah. Because I've never found a person yet who, by using words with no threat of violence or death, can get me to do anything I don't want to do. Yeah. Yeah, that's very powerful, isn't it? I totally, totally agree. Wow. Okay, guys, look, um, this has been really fantastic, hasn't it? We have a lot of positive um, feedback um, from everyone in the room, Paul. So I think this has been, I do like to have, um, you know, question the norm, I suppose, around property. And when I, when you mentioned this one, I just thought, oh, this is so key. And it's certainly, God, I've written loads of notes. Um, it is very, very powerful to, to think about things in a different way. And it's, you know, I've been sort of thinking back over some communications I've had just in the last few weeks and how going forward, I'm, I, you know, I'm definitely going to look at changing those. So, um, yeah, I really, really appreciate you being here. So just again, guys, um, before um, Paul can just do one final closing comment, um, we. Um, yeah, fantastic. So. Gosh, we've got everyone coming in now. Um, yeah, so guys, do remember, if this has been really useful for you, please do um, follow Paul and I, and also please do jump onto the Property Networking House as well, and then you will get told every time we schedule in a new meeting. Um, it is very much kind of an open forum for people to ask questions. Um, and then next week, um, it is going back to my service accommodation Q&A, 
And I have completely forgotten who's on next week, which is really poor of me, isn't it, to uh, to check that. Um, but uh, yes, but we shall be back next week um, with a fantastic person. So let me see. Can I find that? Uh, I can't find it. Anyway, I will be sharing it. So, um, yeah. So, guys. Um, yeah, Paul, please. Thank you. Thank you. As always, you've been an absolute superstar. I really, really appreciate you coming on and uh, questioning the norms, which I think is so, so key and important that a lot of us get set in our ways in the way that we think we might do things. And having that re-energizing, that re-questioning um, is really so incredibly important. So, Paul, I will let you do a closing comment, please. You know, when you think about communication, we can go back centuries um, and there's been some, you know, really wise words about communication. But I've always found the wisest words, the ones that I return to, the ones that I remind myself of um, when I get full of my own phenomenal philosophy, which is those of Sir Francis of Assisi. Listen first to understand, not to be understood. Listen first to understand not to be understood amazing paul very powerful okay guys thank you so much i'm going to shut the room down thanks paul <laughs>